Hey guys, welcome back to this week's episode of We Talk Money. My name is Chris Dunn. I'm your host. I'm here with Nikki, who is a certified financial planner and founder of She Talks Finance, which is a woman-led community for all things investing in money. Uh, we've also got Travis DeVitt, who is a professional hedge fund investor. And on this week's episode, we are going to be talking about, are the markets overheated? There's some really weird stuff happening in the markets right now that we want to talk about. Also, we asked you guys last week, did a survey asking you, what is the hardest part of investing or trading for you? And so we're going to share our experiences and our biggest challenges, uh, but we also want to cover what most of you guys are having issues with, and maybe we can shed some light and some wisdom on that. Um, and then we're going to answer a bunch of questions from you guys. So you guys ready to rock? Let's go. All right. Well, first up. Uh, Travel, I want to pass it to you. Sure. Um, there's some weird stuff happening in the markets, both in stocks and private equity, VC, venture type stuff. What's going on? What's your, I guess, 30,000 foot take on it? Yeah, well, so it's uh, it's interesting because we're finally seeing the market react today uh, for the first time uh, pretty much all year. And we saw some really funky stuff last week and early this week that had me really worried. Nick and I were actually talking to some of the investors in our community about the risks that we were seeing that weren't really being, you know, noticed by the market. Um, we could see things like, you know, bond yields being near their multi-year lows, and you know, yet equity markets were hitting highs. We could see, you know, energy prices and copper, which we talked about last week, uh, you know, having taken a hit. The coronavirus virus stuff. Um, Apple came out and actually had. Um, said that their first quarter earnings were going to be below expectations because of disruptions in the supply chain. Yeah. So there were all those things happening while at the same time, you know, early this week, markets were hitting all time highs and we're starting to see, we were starting to see a lot of froth, especially in the momentum stocks. We were seeing stuff like, you know, Tesla and Virgin Galactic just going parabolic. Um, the whole Wall Street bets community on Reddit was getting lots of uh, airtime around the internet. And yeah, so let, let's talk about that. So it's funny because at, at with different phases of the market, it's like stocks become cool, then they fall out of favor. You know, one month or year crypto and Bitcoin is booming and then it falls out of favor. And yeah. you kind of have this like this wave of attention. And right now, to me, it feels like stocks are kind of the the hotness right now like kind of low floater like highly uh speculative plays we, let, let's dive into that what are we seeing amongst these like really insane movers and in equities yeah so it's feeling a lot like you know back in i don't know what 10 years ago when the pump and dump phase was happening and we were just seeing pump and dumps all over the place in the otc markets that that pattern that chart pattern of you know Big what? Boom I don't know. Three hundred percent, a thousand percent, in a matter of yeah. Pull up SBCE. Yeah, interesting one. No revenue yet. Interesting company. They're trying to do private space travel, but so that, this nowhere. is Virgin Galactic, right? So yeah. what? What's what's the deal for anybody that doesn't know the stock? Yeah. So this was actually this came public through what's called an uh, SPAC, an S P A C, a special purpose acquisition company. So Social Capital, which is run by a famous VC named Chamath, uh, uh, I actually can't even say his last name, Chamath P. <laughs> <laughs> Chamath uh, runs Social Capital. They're a very successful venture fund. You know, they were early investors in Facebook. Um, or actually, Chamath was an early Facebook employee and then spun out and did Social Capital, and they've had some successful investments. But uh, they actually raised a bunch of money. They said, hey, investors, give us a bunch of money. We're going to acquire something um, and have it be a public company. We don't know what yet. And that was about two years ago, I think. So they raised a bunch of money, a couple hundred million bucks, and turns out they actually went and acquired Virgin Galactic, which is a company that's trying to do private space travel. Uh, Richard Branson and Virgin own you know, a majority stake in the company, but it doesn't really have any revenue yet. It's still sort of like this idea of a business almost. Super high risk, could change the world, could be awesome. Yeah. Uh, but you know, d does this chart pattern, and for you guys <laughs> listening on the uh, the podcast, it recently went from about 10 bucks up to over 40. Mm -hmm. uh, what What's causing this? What do you guys think? I mean, honestly, like, I think it's just retail, hot money, you know, people trying to get rich quick. Again, I think Wall Street Bets probably has something to do with it. Uh, I think people, you know, getting really into buying high-risk call options are um, having an impact as well because, what happens when you've got this huge influx of money into call options on stocks like these is the market makers 
who are selling those call options have to then go hedge themselves a stock, which means they're out there buying stock. Um, so it's like buying begets buying, yep. which begets more buying. Yep. Then I you also, get the Momo algorithms yeah. buying too. So I also think that the Tesla move could have could have something to do with this. Yep. People are seeing what Tesla did and they're like, I want to get in on that. And they're looking for the next big stock that's going to do this. So it's and almost like a sympathy play in a way. Oh yeah. In a way. Yeah, yeah. for sure. And you're starting to see it like on uh, and the, again, the wall street bets uh, subreddit, it's a perfect example. People will rotate. They're like, okay, made a bunch of money over the last three days in this. What's next? Yeah. Yeah. We actually even saw like a stock like Lumber Liquidators, like a sleepy little stock. Is that LL? Uh, get LL? pumped up LL. Yeah, yeah, it got pumped up uh, at least for, you know, a moment in time there. <laughs> I um, remember, almost I remember, a double yeah, I over a couple looking of days. That thing when, looking at that thing when it was just dead. And, yeah. Um, yeah, it's definitely an interesting environment right now. And, and I do I do think that Tesla has a lot to do with this type of stuff. Yeah. yeah. It, it, so, and I, I think it's good. We've heard some like some money managers over the past couple of weeks giving their opinion about Tesla and just how it, it attracts new blood into the markets, right? Which I think is a good thing, yeah. but it also attracts more scammers, dumb money that is going to get wiped out and yeah. blown up. And we see a lot of that. I mean, Wall Street Bets, for anybody that doesn't know, is a subreddit on Reddit. And people post their gains, their losses. You have, you know, and, and it's also, it's like survivor bias, right? Like yeah. you'll have somebody that'll post like, I turned uh 70 K into one and a half million, right? Like oh, to your God, <laughs> right? yeah. but, but okay. Let, let's assume that this guy's not going to blow up eventually, which he or she probably will. Yeah. But like the survivorship bias is for every one person like that, there's probably 10,000 that completely lose everything. Right. Yeah. And what's funny when I look at this, like as the mental, you know, investor psychology girl that I am, always thinking about the mental side of things, I look at this and I see, okay, bow to your God, YOLO. Like, <laughs> that is the most emotional sentence that sh it should be so far away yeah. from investing in the markets as possible. Nikki, what do you mean? What is, what could possibly <laughs> be wrong about having a God complex as an investor? You know, Nothing could happen. And I, with I that. hear crypto oh, traders all the time, like YOLOing shit coins and stuff like that. And yeah. that just makes me like, Oh, don't say that. Yeah. You know, think, Think about it a little bit more professionally if you can. Like, yes, have a little fun. Yes, it's funny. Well, you know, and, but it's what, funny to laugh at. But right, and we laugh at it. But what's the real danger behind that? Like, what? Why is that actually a bad thing? Well, I mean, options are extremely risky. The 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 percentage of people who lose money in options is very very high. The probability of losing is very very high, especially when you're buying like these YOLO out of the money call options at high implied volatilities. You really need that stock to make a huge move to actually make money. And if it doesn't, then you could easily be down 100% on your options position within days or weeks. Yeah. So it's high risk, high reward, and over time, usually it's the option sellers. Um, and the market makers that make money, not option buyers. So yeah, I mean, you can have these successes, but uh, but good luck doing that on a long-term basis. Mm -hmm. Yep, and usually, so what, what I've seen in my experience is people that make a massive amount of money early, they get that God, God complex. And then it's like a gambler who has a hot streak at a blackjack table, right? Mm. Holy shit, I'm up. I've 10 X my bankroll. And then next thing you know, they're going to the ATM to pull out more yes. cash because they gave it all back, yeah. right? That's right. Yep. Yeah, you get confident, you get, you know, you, you do get that euphoria high when you have a big win, you know, and it takes a lot of practice to be able to, to stop yourself from feeling that way and feeling like completely calculated about the whole process. It's way easier said than done, but yeah. it's essential if you want to go the long, the long distance with this, you know, if you want to stay around yeah. and not blow up account after Have account staying power. I actually, I actually um, was reading a book again this week uh, that I've read a couple times about, um, about the dot com uh, bubble and bust because I felt like I was seeing a lot of parallels in that from that environment uh, to what we're, what we were seeing over the last couple of weeks. And I mean, this thing, by the way, this may not be over. We're, we're seeing a market correction today, but, um, but this environment, this hot money FOMO environment may not be over. We don't know. It can last a long time. Yeah. And, and that's what happened in the dot com bubble and stocks were making crazy moves. Short sellers were getting taken out on stretchers, uh, even like really legendary hedge fund managers. That's what a lot of this book was about was, you know, people were in people like Warren Buffett, one of the greatest investors of all time. People were looking at them and saying, you know, is your strategy out of favor? Like, are you done? Like, do you not, you know, know what you're doing anymore? Is this a new era, new age? 
And it new paradigm, out, baby. <laughs> yeah, it turned out obviously that most of those stocks ended up being down 90 to 100%, but they were up five, six, 700% in 98, 99 before they went on to essentially you know go down 90 to 100%. So for a while, the legendary guys looked stupid for you know being in undervalued stocks and avoiding these hot Momo stocks. Um, but eventually that all corrects itself. So I think we'll see the same thing here is like, again, we don't know, this could last another year or two, um, but I think eventually like this is all going to correct itself as it always does. Like, yeah. Yeah. And like you've, we, I think we've talked about this in prior episodes, but you've actually looked at the data on momentum strategies and there mm -hmm. is alpha there. Like yep. it actually works. You can make money riding quote unquote, you know, ridiculous trends. Yep. And it's like that whole idea of buying gets more buying and encourages more buying. It's like, so how can you go along with the trend, even if it's irrational and make money and protect yourself on the downside. Yeah, well, one, there are ways to like hedge yourself with with other types of assets. But two, I think there's a difference too between a nice steady trend and when you have parabolic charts and you're trying to trace that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, a chart like, let's say like Microsoft or Domino's Pizza, if you wanna pull up one of, one of those, really good long-term business results behind the trend in those stocks. Whereas with SPCE, a company with no revenue that's gone up 5X in a couple weeks, mm -hmm. um, you know, I think that the momentum strategies probably uh, have more long-term alpha in, in these longer-term trends as opposed to trying to chase hot money exactly. spikes. Yeah, so. yeah. And, and, you know, I feel like a lot of people start with those low volume, highly volatile stocks or crypto, right? We've got a lot of new people in the markets that came in through crypto, which I think is great. Um, I think what that can do though is set kind of um, unrealistic expectations sometimes of mm -hmm. like what, what things can gain, which has been great for the past few years. I mean, we've made a shit ton of money off of that. But when you look at stocks that are tied to, or they're supposed to be tied to revenue, and profits, mm -hmm. right? Like real world yeah. things. Wow. Um, what a concept. What is <laughs> but, but uh, you know, you get these guys and ladies in these like day trading chat rooms that are following some front running guru, right? Who's like just sending trade alerts, piling in and then dumping on their followers. Like I hate that so many people start their investing journey that way, yeah. but it just seems to be that way. Like the people that yeah. get started early, they look at these get rich quick guys and they follow them and then they learn later, oh, this person that I'm supposed to be trusting is actually stealing from me because they're trading against me. Mm. And then a lot of people just blow up and then leave the industry altogether. Yeah. Yeah, it's very unfortunate. Yeah. The snapback, by the way, for like momentum trades can be vicious because like as we saw uh, even this week on Thursday and Friday, those gains can evaporate so fast. And that's what happened in the dot-com bubble. Literally, when that thing bursts in March of 2000, there were, I think the NASDAQ was down like 20 or 30% within a month or two. So yeah. like you can have these things just reverse so fast. What, what, what's the, the phrase? Takes, takes, the, stairs takes the stairs up and the up elevator, and the elevator down. down. I like right. to say, takes the stairs up and then like jumps out the window. Like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, look at that bar. To, uh, this is the yeah. This is yes. the hourly on the S and P. Uh, yeah, you can see. I mean, literally, I think within a few minutes on Thursday, um, it looked like there might be a, a reversal happening, and it just you know happened in an instant. And I yeah, you would even see it even more dramatic in the Nasdaq. So uh, you got to be careful out there when you're when you're trend riding in an environment like this because it can turn on a dime. Yeah, absolutely. So okay, so that's the stock market. Um, you know, crypto pretty actually um, sane market conditions, I should say, <laughs> over the past week. Sane and crypto in the same <laughs> right? Uh But, you know, we also get these crashes, right? And uh, I, I made a funny tweet. I'm like, you know, in, in crypto, you're going to get parabolic spikes, dumps, washouts, traps, fake outs, breakouts. You know, you get all this kind of crazy action. But actually, the, the past couple of months um, have actually been pretty just stair-stepping and stable yeah. uh, across Bitcoin. Um, and then, you know, Tezos, one of my, uh, my bigger trades of the year so far, still just maintaining its nice little bull run. So, um, nothing too crazy to talk about there as far as like crypto prices. One thing I did want to mention talking about frothy markets is the venture space. So startup capital and angel rounds and VC rounds and private equity rounds. Mm -hmm. We've got some data that I, I wanted to pull up here. Travis, you showed me this chart. Mm -hmm. So what is this? Why don't you explain what's going on here? 
Yeah, so this is this is actually a chart showing how much money has been raised by uh, venture funds essentially over the last few years, and it shows it by year. And you can see that 2019 was like a crazy banner year for new funds being raised for venture capital funds, which means there's almost small, a trillion dollars yeah. compared to what 500 billion in 2018. Yeah, so a massive influx of new money coming into the venture funding space. Yeah, so I, I tweeted about this a few days ago, just saying like, it seems to me like there's a lot of dumb venture capital money chasing bad deals, mm -hmm. right? Whenever you, it's it's kind of like a, a balancing act where on one hand you have capital, like available capital, and, and then over here you have like deal flow. And when you have way more capital than there is quality deal flow, things get overvalued, right? So it's simple supply and demand, but it's private, so it's harder to see, mm -hmm. right? Unless you're like in the space. And like, I, I've really pulled back from startup investing over the past couple of years. But from what I am seeing, just my personal opinion and anecdotally, like it feels like things are just getting stupid. Like I'm seeing companies get these crazy funding rounds that shouldn't even be considered. And maybe this is because all of these funds that, you know, there's a trillion dollars of capital that needs to be deployed and mm -hmm. they're, ch they're all chasing the same shit. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. We saw what happened with SoftBank last year and WeWork, you know, that it works until it doesn't. And then the whole thing can, again, just reverse and blow up on yeah. us. We saw it in the dot com bust. So. Yeah. And so this is another chart. So even though, so this is like going quarterly, this is actual like deals that got funded. Mm -hmm. um, they're actually down, right? So like uh, slightly. So like the amount of deals getting funded is down, but the capital is still going up. Mm -hmm. To me, that says over the next year, it's probably only going to be worse and worse quality deals getting funded. Yeah, I, I think, and we've seen valuations get pushed up a lot, especially in the later funding rounds. Yeah. Um, so not only do we have venture funds, you know, raising more and more capital, but we now have like public market hedge funds actually participating in late stage rounds as well. So there's just a lot of money, especially in those later rounds, uh, chasing these growth companies and it's really pushed up valuations. We saw, again, we work a perfect example, Casper, another yeah. example yeah. where, you know, some of their later funding rounds were done at multi-billion dollar valuations. They were trying to take that company public at high valuations and had to keep cutting yep. the valuation that they actually went public at because when you got to face public markets in reality, it's like, well, sorry y'all, but you know, you funded this thing at too high of a valuation. It kind of gives me some like hope for you know everyone's all mad about the stock market and the fed and all of that and it's like you know what though one one thing we have going for us here is we we are being mindful of valuations with these ipos at least most people are starting to these companies are being humbled once they get to the public market some of That's them good. are yeah, some of yeah. Them. like uber yeah. and lyft last year were, were forced to actually essentially raise their prices and cut their their losses because the public markets were forcing discipline on them I yeah. think Our I saw, was it Uber was laying off a bunch of people this week? Uh, oh, that's interesting. Yeah, I hadn't seen that, but it wouldn't shock me. Yeah, I, mean, I did see that they their last report was saying they were going to be profitable sooner than expected. Mm, interesting. Which is what propped, uh, that's what caused the, I think, the move. Yeah, up. from the beginning of the year, they're up, uh, up quite a bit. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, awesome. So yeah, so a lot of things, a lot of risks in public markets and venture capital. Um, let's move on to this week's survey, which is what is the hardest part of investing or trading for you? We had about 600 responses and nearly half were timing entries and exits. Um, in second place, it was mental game issues. So about a third of people struggle with the mental side of investing and trading. Mm -hmm. And then in third place, it was position sizing and risk management. And then we got some, some other answers that we'll get to, uh, in, during the Q and a, but why don't we just start by talking about, I guess, where we are in our individual career paths with investing and trading, mm -hmm. what are our the, the things that we're struggling with or the, the biggest challenges that we're having now. Nikki, why don't you start? I will start by saying that investing is 80% mindset, 20% actions. Mm. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. Like of that buying and selling and the hitting the buttons, 80% mm -hmm. what's going on up in here mm. and how you're planning out your trading. I just want to say that. Mm -hmm. 
for me, my biggest struggle is sometimes I'll take too long to get into a position. I'll, I'll just kind of wait too long. So is or, it like a paralysis by analysis type thing? It's a, yeah, it's, it's a paralysis by analysis or if I have a lot of opportunities that are coming up at the same time, I'm trying to, you know, weigh out and measure, okay, how much do I want to be in this one? How, which one is the priority? And, you know, it's just working through all that sometimes takes a lot of time for me. Mm -hmm. And so I'll wait too long and then boom, stocks up 15%. And then I'm like, crap. I miss my miss because I'm, I like, I like to get a good deal. You know, I'm a bargain shopper Yeah, and I, and same. Travis and I have talked about this a million times. Like I'm not chasing stuff. If, if I think the ship has sailed, I'm okay. Bye. So you have no problem letting things go, no. but your thing might be, you wait a little too long yeah. and then the market reacts and then it's like, Oh, okay. Missed out. Exactly. <clears throat> so what do you think you can do to improve that? Well, um, I probably need to stop looking at so many opportunities at one time and just try to like drill down to a few tickers and do, cause you have to do a lot of research. I mean, you, you're diving into all of the fun, fundamental side of the company, all the reports you're, you know, modeling and all of these things. And so it can take a lot of time. Yeah. Um, so I probably just need to pare down and just focus Sounds like we need to get you guys some interns. <laughs> <laughs> Not a bad idea. Yeah. <laughs> some research interns. Yeah. There we go. Okay, cool. Thanks for sharing that. So Travis, what's your, actually, I think we've actually got a tweet from you too, don't yeah, we? Yeah, and my mine definitely aligns with the survey there with timing entries and exits because I actually tweeted, uh, yeah, earlier, uh, or I guess late last week about the, uh, my biggest struggle tends to be exits. Um, I've talked about this a little bit, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, it's something I, I know about myself and it's, um, and yet it's still something I have to like continually work at to get better. So like I mentioned some stocks there that, uh, I sold early. So the good news is I was able to find some really, really amazing stocks that went on to become, you know, some of the market's biggest winners. Mm -hmm. So that, I take some comfort in, but I sold all of these too early, whether that was Priceline Booking, Lululemon, Square, we've talked about, uh, Ferrari, Live Nation, AMD. I identified all the Roku, perfect example, was up 500% last year. I bought it near the low and I sold it for like a triple when I could have been up another two, 300%. Uh, so I actually even have a video on my YouTube channel about booking because it was a mistake that cost uh, cost me a significant amount of money and cost my fund significant amount of money of missed profits. And so I, I continually have to refocus on getting better at this. And, and, a, and an investor actually, a friend of mine on Twitter, Eric, asked me, well, okay, so what have you learned and how have you tried to get better at this? And I thought that was a great question to ask. Mm -hmm. And as I reflected on it, I said, I think there's two main things that I've really tried to focus on to get better at selling, you know, not selling my winners too early. One, I've adjusted my mental models to understand that about myself and, and try to hang on to winners longer because businesses, great businesses, when you buy them, typically they will grow longer and faster than you expect them to. And so knowing that has helped me adjust actually my mental and financial models so that when I do find something interesting, you know, I'm saying, okay, I'm not going to taper off the growth rates as dramatically. I think maybe they can grow for, you know, longer and higher. I mean, we see companies, large companies like Amazon, Apple, Google, for instance, Netflix, those are very large businesses that continue to grow at high sustained 20% plus revenue year after year. Yeah. So I've adjusted my models and then I've also started to do things with my positions like leave on runner positions, which is actually something you two have both really taught me in your trading systems where um, essentially you create a rule for yourself where you do have profit targets where you will take profits off the table, but no matter what the valuation is, you're gonna leave a runner position on yeah. because positions will often move further than you ever think they will. Yeah, I found that to be really helpful because like trying to guess when something is going to top out is nearly impossible, right? Yeah. And I've left millions of dollars on the table by closing too early. That's something that I've gotten a lot better at and scaling out is such 
a huge helper for oh, that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, scaling out for the win. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And you guys, I mean, you do so much work to find these massive gainers, right? Mm -hmm. Like, first and foremost, they don't happen every day, right? Oh, wow. Second, like, it takes work to really like mine that gold out. Yeah. So, like, yep. when you do that, yeah, you're right. It, it takes discipline to give it time to work and and to actually reap the rewards from it. Yeah, you're lucky to find one to two really phenomenal multi-bagger investments a year. So when you find them, hang on to them, right? <laughs> yeah. The market, I like to think of it this way too, the market will always take things further below fair value than they think on the downside than you think it's worth. Um, and then it will also take it way above the fair value that you think it's worth when it's working. Mm -hmm. So Beautifully said. Yeah. 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 Awesome. Um, so what are you going to do going forward to make sure that you don't close too early. <laughs> I need that intern to just like hit me with a fly swatter. You, you need a shocker. Hey, like you a, know, I'm good at just letting call. stuff run so you can call me anytime. Yeah, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm gonna continue leaning on Nikki to help me with that. Um, yep. Like I said, I'm gonna, uh, you know, have that rule in place where um, even, even if my financial model says the stock is overvalued and I need to take profits, I'm gonna make sure that I leave at least a, a portion of my position on as a runner and yeah, as a runner. Yeah. Cause what that does, whenever you scale out of a trade, it does like three things. It first, it takes some profit, right? Like you actually collect real profit. Mm -hmm. Second, it gives you an opportunity to adjust your risk where like, instead of like saying, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to have room where I could potentially lose five, 10, 20% on this. Maybe you can bring a mental or a hard stop loss into the positive territory mm. where you go, I've taken profit. I've essentially eliminated risk. If I'm able to put my stop zone above my entry. And number three is it leaves you open for more profit. Mm. So it's kind of the best of all worlds, no matter yeah. what the market does. And, you know, we talk a lot about the idea of managing your trades in a way that will leave you with no regrets no matter what happens yeah right so if you ever like I, I tweeted this week too talking about like if if you're ever nervous in a trade it probably means you're either sized too big meaning you're risking too much mm -hmm. uh you don't have a plan uh or both right mm -hmm. like if you don't have a plan it's going to be really difficult to know when to get out and if you don't predefine those targets ahead of time you yeah. know, what do you do? You're just swinging for the fences and looking at Wall Street bets and trying to <laughs> listen to the, the herd mentality and then you're gonna really get screwed. So it's funny because a lot of people, they feel like they have, because I do tell people, make a plan, right? You need a plan going into your, your trade or your investment, yeah. having your targets and stuff. But what I also tell people, don't, because they get overwhelmed and they get, they don't want to fall off from their plan. They don't want to change their plan. Mm -hmm. But what I like to tell people is you're constantly analyzing new data. And this is what I teach. Like new data is coming in all the time. Yeah. You need to take, the, take in that data. It's like with Dropbox, which is another story, but new data has come in, reanalyze, uh, shift your plan accordingly to, to that data to make you feel more comfortable. And it's okay to change your plan. You mm -hmm. just, got to make sure you have something going into the into the trade yeah. right mm -hmm. but people get caught up with oh well, i don't want to stray from my plan it's not straying from your plan it's reanalyzing the data and then going to the new possibilities going forward yeah. it's like in poker so like you get your initial hand and you make bets based on that and then as more cards come out that's more information and you can make adjustments to your plan based on that it's the same thing with the markets right yep in the in right. the world of statistics they call that the bayesian approach and that's gotten like hugely hot over the last 10 or 20 years is like bayes theorem and the bayesian approach to like updating your priors um, and it's exactly right. It's actually what would have helped me with the price line investment, uh, you know, 10, 12 years ago. Um, if I, I, you know, I was updating my financial models, but um, when you, I was still anchored to s kind of old data in, in, in a way. Old targets maybe. Yeah. Yeah. yeah old, yeah. old uh, models of how I thought the, the revenue growth w rates were going to taper off when what I was actually seeing in the data suggested they were accelerating revenue growth. And yeah. I had truly updated my priors correctly. I would have not sold the stock. Price anchoring is so real, right? Mm -hmm. Like for me in the early days of like Ethereum, like the first breakout trade was a dollar fifty, and we thought fifteen dollars was like an insane price. We were like, oh my oh, god, yeah. we just ten xed, and then we were celebrating, and then like several months later, we're up over a thousand dollars, right? So we had trading opportunities there, but like 
that's why I always say like never underestimate what markets can do because yeah. they can go crazy. So that's a good segue. What's your, uh, what's the hardest thing for you in investing? So mine has changed over the years a lot. Like it, it seems like every couple of years I struggle with something new. Mm. It used to be, so like a decade ago when I was day trading, it used to be over trading. Mm. Like I was so impatient. Naturally, I'm like the worst trader. Like my, like my DNA, I'm like <laughs> not built for it at all. Like there's some people I meet and I'm like, you're the rare, you know, unicorn. Like you are naturally built to be an investor. That's but how I feel yeah. about you. Well, most people aren't, right? And like, it's taken me, so much fucking effort to like, <laughs> to really become good at what I'm good at, right? You have to figure out what that is yeah. and what you're not good at. And so it used to be like over trading. It used to be, you know, all the beginner shit, like yeah. revenge trading and the downhill spiral. Yeah. Um, now that I'm like pretty consistent and I, I know what my strengths and my weaknesses are, what I'm trying to get better at is growing size, like appropriately. Because here's what happens. Once you become profitable and once you know where your niche is and what you're good at, you're going to always be pushing that boundary of trading bigger and bigger position sizes, mm -hmm. right? So I remember when like a $5,000 loss was like a big deal mm -hmm. and then it was 10,000 and then it was 20,000 and then it was 50,000. And so now I'm trying to like, as you grow your position sizes and as your account grows, I think it's important to think in terms of percentages and not the dollar amount. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's easier said than done though. Absolutely. Like it is. Whenever I do the math and I'm like looking at these sizes where I'm like, holy shit, I am swinging more than I used to make in several years on one trade. Right. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. And like that, that plays, that can play tricks on your your mind. Yep. And so for me, I'm pretty good at like waiting for profit targets now. I, that that was one thing I used to struggle with was closing too early, but after a few years, um, got really good at scaling out and not regretting closing too early or too late. Now it's just like making sure I'm trading a big enough size to make it worth it and going heavier earlier. So like on Tezos, like accumulating heavier at 50 cents as opposed to my buys at 70. Mm -hmm. Like, so it, it's kind of weird. And most people maybe can't relate to that quite yet if they haven't built size in that way. Mm -hmm. But like, that's just something I'm struggling with. And I, I wouldn't even say struggling with, but it's something I'm cognizant of and I'm thinking about. And I'm like, same thing. Like I'm, I'm being patient. I'm putting in the time to find these opportunities. When they come along, you got to have the, the conviction to go heavy yeah, and to, to, to not look back and go, shit, I could have, I could have done more. Four times yeah. the size on that, or, you know, something like that. Yeah. So, yeah. so I'm getting much better at that. And I feel like that's a constant evolution. And what can happen is you can take a loss where you lose more than you ever have previously as well. Mm -hmm. So you have to be able to handle a bigger dollar amount losses too. Yep. Which goes back to the psychological in your head stuff that you mentioned earlier, yeah. the mental, the mental game. Yeah. Yeah. I think everything's tied to the mental side, right? Yeah. It, well, and that's why we talk about investing being, you know, a journey. We, we call it the investing journey because a great investor is even ones who are good at what they do still are trying to learn and figure out what parts they can get better at. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's, you it's a life stop thing. learning. You never stop practicing. It's a practice. Yeah. 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 It's a skill set and the markets are always changing, right? Yeah. So like what worked this year is probably not going to work next year in the yep. exact same way. Yeah. Cool. All right. You guys want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah. Good lessons. I feel like let's uh, jump into some Q and a here guys. So first question uh, from Kirk, this was actually in response to the survey about timing and, or about struggles. And his question specifically was timing in crypto uh, lately. Bitcoin seems to drag all of the altcoins around. So I've been placing smaller bets. Volumes have been getting better though. What's your experience on this? I think that's a great question. So uh, there, there's a couple of pieces here that I want to tackle. So the first is Bitcoin seems to be dragging the altcoins around. Mm. And there's some truth to that. And, and the markets kind of move in different phases. So we go through time periods where it's like Bitcoin is king. And if Bitcoin's going up, we get this kind of like all ships rise thing where all altcoins are, are chasing and pumping like 2017. Um, and then we get 
some weird moments where there's like an inverse relationship where like if Bitcoin's going up, Ethereum will sell off or if people are dumping Bitcoin, they'll buy Ethereum or some other altcoins. So, because like when people sell Bitcoin, they don't all sell into fiat currency, right? Like you can sell your Bitcoin for dollars or euros or whatever, but you can also sell Bitcoin for altcoins mm -hmm. so that the capital flow, it's like these levers and like different things happen at different times. And so what I've noticed since the beginning of the year really is like, yeah, a lot of things are tied kind of directly to Bitcoin's price, but what can happen and what I've noticed is when you get quality projects or projects that just have a lot of attention, like, Tezos, Chainlink, you know, there's like a few of them that they get disjointed from Bitcoin. Mm. And when they take on a capital flow and a life of their own, those are the ones I really like to trade. Mm. And you cut, you have to be early. You have to think about it and think like, okay, why would this take off even if it Bitcoin sells off? Right. So, um, so I, I mean, he says, uh, I'm, I'm been placing smaller bets, which I think is probably smart. You know, if, if you don't have a lot of conviction and you don't really see something clearly and Bitcoin's kind of moving all your positions around. Yeah. I mean, I have pulled way back on altcoins. Like I am extremely selective. I only trade stuff that's super liquid. So really maybe the top 10 or 20 altcoins on the market capitalists. Mm. Um, I don't trade shit coins, like real small stuff for several reasons, but the biggest being like, they're just easily manipulated and they're harder to trade, right? And you can get stuck in a trade if you're trading with a big bankroll. So, um, so my experience, and I guess if, if there is any advice is, yeah, just be very selective. You know, you don't have to go out there and buy 50 to 100 or more coins. In fact, I think most cryptocurrencies are going to go to zero anyway. So you should be even more selective. Mm. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. Interesting point about the, you know, finding the coins that are less correlated to Bitcoin, because yeah, if, if all your alts are almost hundred percent correlated Bitcoin, then really you just, you're, you're making this, you're making the same bet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah. And to your point, so there's two ways to look at the price of an altcoin it's the price compared to a fiat currency like the dollar or whatever and the price of it compared to bitcoin so i'll just pull this up on a chart we'll do this really quickly um so basically what i mean is like when you're looking at bitcoin you're typically looking at like btc usd charts right what is the value of bitcoin in my local currency whatever that is right that's the the easiest way for people right now to think about it when you think of like an altcoin so like Tezos, for example, at the time of this recording, it's $3 and 50 cents. You know, we were buying back here around, you know, 50 cents, right? So it's up quite a bit in terms of dollar value, which is how I actually measure my portfolio. But you could also compare the price of Tezos to Bitcoin. And you can see that really only broke out recently. So Tezos has actually gained on Bitcoin in recent times where before it was really floundering because Bitcoin was going up and Tezos was kind of like flat. So what that is, is it's an opportunity cost. So if you're buying all these altcoins and they're just kind of flat in dollar terms and then Bitcoin's going up, you're actually losing uh, unrealized gains. Like you'd be better off in Bitcoin, yep. right? So there, that's kind of an extra level of complexity or an extra lever that we have in crypto that you don't really think about in the stock market. It, it actually does remind me a little bit of the stock market in the sense that we talk about trying to beat the S&P 500. Mm. So we talk about active money managers, they're picking stocks and, and making choices just, you know, mm -hmm. it's what we do. Yeah. And you know, if you're not beating the market as a whole, if you're consistently underperforming the market, then maybe you should look at what you're doing and say, yeah hey, maybe I should just be a passive investor and own yeah. the market index. Very yeah. true, you know? Nick. I mean, we talk about this and you know a lot of the, the data from the financial planning space. Like, um, what do you think? I mean, should people really be picking stocks or are they better off just indexing? Well, you know, for most people, passive investing, index investing is the better choice because they don't, they're, they're working professionals. They may not be as interested in picking stocks like we are and yeah. doing diving into balance sheets and you know cash flow statements they might not be into that so for them it's fine for them to be doing passive investing yeah. but if you have the time and the interest and the ability there's there you can find alpha 
you yeah. know, it, but, but obviously you got to know what you're doing. Yeah. There's, there are a lot of people out there and most people picking stocks probably aren't beating the market, but they may not have, it's a skill. You, it's a skill that you have to develop. Would you agree? Yeah, yeah. Oh, for sure. And it's a competition yeah. too, right? Like yeah. Yeah. that's and why a lot of people lose. So much goes into it. You have to look at, you know, okay, where are you buying this? Like in terms of valuation, mm -hmm. where are you buying the stock at? You might be sitting on it for a little bit before the market catches up and finally you see it like Dropbox. Mm -hmm. Recently we've seen that one. 22% today. Up, yeah, up, up over 20%. But it was a it was kind of just doing nothing for a while, but you had to be getting in when it was doing nothing and right. boring and you had to be okay with that. And that's hard for a lot of people. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And so I think that actually kind of can bring us full circle back to the survey and the the biggest answer, which is, you know, to, to the question of what is the hardest part of investing or trading for you? It's timing entries and exits. Why don't we give some advice to the 50% of people that check that as their answer? Like what can help people with entries and exits? Timing, entries, and exits. So you have to, I mean, analysis, that leads back to analysis, right? Like that's the core of everything. Whether it's technical or fundamental, you um, have to have an idea of where you'll, you wanna get in the trade at, right? So for example, uh, I don't know, if you're looking at the S&P 500 and maybe you, you're looking at it on a technical level and 3000 is where you'd wanna enter you know, the trade. Well, you kind of have to stock price and 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 wait for it to get to your areas, right? Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a it's all about having a plan and and analyzing whatever it is you're doing, whether it's the chart or the fundamentals. Yeah. And being like, okay, I know that if Twitter goes down to twenty five dollars a share, this is where I want to be in. This is where I'm interested in the stock. And you have a fundamental reason backing that, right? Yeah. You have a thesis. A thesis yeah. yeah. And uh, if you're just winging it and you're like looking at it, at, if you're looking at a Tesla chart right now and you're like, oh, it's going crazy and I want to get in on this. And, and you, 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 either you don't or you do, you're not sure how to do it or how to time it. It's like, well. So, so wait, it's not smart to go on Wall Street bets and <laughs> no, look no, at what no. people are talking about yeah, and then like, just they follow them. Plans. There's they're, no edge there. Yeah, yeah there's no edge, there's no plan. They're just, it's greed FOMO. Exactly. Yeah. Um, which is usually a disaster, uh, long, longer term. It's the greater fool theory, right? Yeah. yeah. And a lot of it is simply, when you're trying to time an entry, it's simply being able to be patient enough to wait for price to get to that area. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Yeah, I mean, cause trading is, it, there's a, a catch 22. For most markets like that trade 24 seven, like Bitcoin, you can buy or sell at any given time that you want. There's mm -hmm. endless opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. um, but that doesn't mean that that's a good time to buy or sell. So you, you have to set those parameters for yourself. You have to define what that means for you and you have to be right. And I will give another tip for this. Um, another tip for this would be something that Travis and I both do. I can't speak on your behalf, but we will scale in. Not only do we scale out of trades, but we scale into trades. So we give ourselves, like if we're not sure, okay, we're not sure if we're going to see the pullback we're looking for to get the price that we want, right? But we want to have some skin in the game. You scale a little bit of your position in, and then if it goes lower, you scale in a little bit more, and you leave yourself some room. It doesn't necessarily have to be all or nothing yeah and i think that's the 50 percent of people that are struggling with this that might be how they're thinking about it like oh i gotta either get in or not not necessarily you know yeah uh, right. i love it what, what about you try anything to add to that yeah no nick hit on a lot of those there, there's a set of rules we 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 talk about in some of our courses uh, even like the hedge fund playbook stuff uh, that i have out there uh we touch on some of this and it's probably a little bit broader than what we have today in terms of scope but those points are perfect. Like on the entry side, a lot of people are probably struggling with entries because they don't know what their edge is. They don't know why they're getting into a trade. Find what works for you, whether you're a trend person and you wanna do momentum, uh, figure out what things trigger that for you that would, sh that would get you into a good risk reward trade. If you're a fundamental person like I am, then it's you know looking for uh, the right mismatch between price and value, right? A company whose price isn't reflecting what I think the longer term value of the company is. And that takes work. That takes, you know, going through uh, company statements and balance sheets and cash flow statements and, and coming up with a target of what, what I think the company and the stock price is actually worth, right? So it's yeah. work. But that then gives me the confidence to make the entry. And so 
Scaling in, obviously very, very important too. I'll typically take a, take a starter position and then I'll keep doing more work. I'll use the, the data, like we said, in the Bayesian approach where I'll you know, keep updating my thesis. And then you know, if it starts to actually keep going down and I'm confident in my position, then I have confidence to make it larger and I'll go ahead and do that. If my thesis changes, then that makes it easy on the exit because I'm out. Yeah. Like I'm not gonna stick around. Like if my thesis has changed, I'm out. Yeah, uh, and we've done that on a couple stocks this year, and it and it was a good idea, and it worked yeah. worked oh, yeah. out. Um, yeah. So yeah, I would say that, and then like we talked about er, uh, earlier too on the exit strategy, one thing as well is keeping a runner position on positions that are working because the market will often take it way above fair value. Yeah, so. awesome. Yeah, and th there are some crossovers between like TA, like technical analysis and fundamental. Mm -hmm. um, for a lot of people to get started, I, I think a lot of people start kind of with technical trading because it's easier, I guess. Yeah. But um, for people that are trading based on technicals, like it's, it's actually pretty easy to know when to get in, like on a breakout, yeah. like you, you have an entry trigger. And if you're looking for a dip, you have the dip area, like it, it's very simple. And then with, um, with profit targets, you can use things like Fibonacci extensions and prior price areas and measured moves. And I always like to predefine a profit target. And then like, no matter what the market does, if I get to that profit target, I'm taking something off the table and then reevaluating later. So I think if people just do those kind of simple things, have if, for fundamentals, like you said, have a thesis, know how to use position sizing for technicals, identify, have setups, have setups right? Yeah, yeah, like have a have an actual trade set up and then follow that plan. Yep. Yeah, and even just patience, like we've talked about, like your, um, you know, trade less, profit more on the entry side, you don't have to be constantly entering different trades, you know, find the ones that are really high reward to risk setups. Yeah. Yeah. Go for higher probability, higher reward to risk, which is hard to know in the beginning. Like it takes a little bit of yeah. um, experience and guidance maybe to get there. Yeah. So yeah. Awesome. All right. So next question, Will asks, uh, I saw that Travis briefly mentioned the Kelly criterion. Uh, can you guys compound on that and how it applies to equities trading? Um, yeah, you want to take that? <laughs> yeah, so this could be the topic of an entire show uh, or course, and I actually do delve into it really deeply. This is a topic I got super geeked out on over the last couple of years. The Kelly Criterion, uh, just briefly though, is all about uh, position optimal position sizing, right? There's a sweet spot between having too little of a position where it doesn't generate enough profit, even if it's a winner, and too large of a position to where if it goes against you, you lose too much of your capital and then you're set back so far that you know, you're know you gonna really underperform for years. So the sweet spot, finding that optimal position size is what the Kelly criterion is intended to do. Now in equity trading or in equity investing, it, um, it there are some like nuances to it that, uh, that are important. So the Kelly criterion originated from um, really the guy who popularized it is a guy named Ed Thorpe. Ed Thorpe, awesome guy. Uh, he wrote a book called Beat the Dealer. He originally was focused on this uh, through the game of blackjack. So he looked at blackjack and he figured out a way to get an edge against the casino by counting cards. And what he realized was that he needed to increase his bet dramatically when he had the edge and scale the bet back when he didn't have the edge. And that actually allowed his bankroll to grow at uh, you know really, really abnormal rates. Uh, at the maximum rate. And he used the formula that was developed by John Kelly and Claude Shannon, two scientists at Bell Labs. And there's a lot we could say and go into on Kelly Criterion, but there's a couple books if you wanna read more about it. Fortune's Formula is probably the most accessible book on the topic. Uh, I recommend that. It's a good entertaining read that also explains a lot of the concepts behind it. Uh, there's some more technical books as well if you wanna go deep. Uh, unfortunately, the internet has a lot of misinformation and actually uh, doesn't always present the Kelly Criterion formula correctly. So you got to be careful on that. Uh, but stay tuned for some more stuff from me. I'm going to be talking more about the Kelly Criterion and position sizing, um, you know, later on and in more shows. And, and cool. And we'll we'll link up your YouTube channel because I know you have some more content planned on that. So for sure, awesome. All right. So next question. <laughs> this is, I don't, I don't really know if this is a question. This is just something I wanted to talk about. Uh, somebody said, here's the thing. Bitcoin is not scarce. Firstly, it forks. There are those that say Bitcoin cash is the real Bitcoin. Secondly, the altcoin market exists. Litecoin exists. So while there's only one gold, there are many cryptos that can be used instead of Bitcoin. It's more economic to invest in a basket of altcoins than just plonk everything into Bitcoin. 
there, there's quite a lot to unpack here and I'm going to try to keep this as simple as I can. Yeah. Um, this is like, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah. Oh man. So this is, uh, what's the, the gold bugs name? Peter, uh, Schiff? Peter Schiff. This is kind of like his argument is like, Oh, Bitcoin isn't scarce. You can, you can copy it as many times as you want. Sure. And I could come out with Chris Bitcoin fork, right? Mm -hmm. And I could tell everybody I'm Satoshi Nakamoto <laughs> and this, this is my vision. Hmm, maybe this has happened in recent history where this is Satoshi's original vision for Bitcoin. So buy this Bitcoin, right? First of all, let me say, this is what I love about crypto is that we're, we are redefining what money is and it's a competition. Mm. To me, I'm, I just like eat popcorn and sit on the sidelines <laughs> and go, yeah, let's fight over it. Let's, let's have discussions. Let's fight about what is the real Bitcoin and what is money, right? And so to say that Bitcoin is not scarce, I will say that is categorically false because Bitcoin Core, BTC, 21 million Bitcoin, that's it. Bitcoin Cash, Bitcoin SV, Bitcoin, all these diamond, all these other clone coins, they are different things. And if the founders or the creators, anonymous or known, can convince people that that is the real Bitcoin and that that has value, that will attract capital to that coin and, and hashing power to that uh, network. Uh, if not, it's essentially worthless. So to say that Bitcoin is not scarce is wrong. To say that it can be easily copied is true. And I, you know, again, the 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 value comes from convincing people that it is money so i like coins prices in the gutter i mean the the creator of it cashed out at the all-time highs and he publicly said so yeah. right so you get these weird dynamics um and then to say that like uh you know it's more economic to invest in a basket of altcoins that kind of goes back to our idea that hey, most of these are actually gonna fail. So, you know, if you look at the probabilities, <clears throat> if you diversify, say, in the top 1,000 coins, I think there's about a 99.9% .9 chance that you're gonna underperform Bitcoin or one of the top coins in the top 10 of the market cap, right? Mm -hmm. So, again, is Bitcoin scarce? Absolutely. Does it fork? Yes, absolutely. But the, uh, the, the real value comes from the utility and, and where the hashing power is, right? And where the, the network effect is. And Bitcoin has first mover advantage. It has most of the hashing power and it is the gold of digital currencies. And could that change? Absolutely. Um, I, I, I think this is something we could talk about again for hours and hours and hours, but I just kind of wanted to say a few things about that. Oh yeah, I think I even have a stronger opinion than you because I think the forks increasingly become less and less effective and I think that any future forks are just gonna be laughed at. Yeah. Like I think it's it's sort of, um, it's sort of silly to, to think that like each additional fork is gonna be as popular as Bitcoin. We've even seen the first couple of major forks that had like, you know, people behind it from the early Bitcoin community, even those are starting to fall back now versus Bitcoin. And I think, you know, it's, I would be shocked if in 10, 20 years from now, any forks are even in the top 10. Yeah. Yeah. We'll see. And like, I welcome it. I, I think it's great. Like some people get really tribal about it and they're like, no, Bitcoin cash is the real Bitcoin. I'm like, look, I'm, I'm, I, I kind of view myself as an outsider and say, okay, what, what does each one what, what are the economics of each one? What, what does the mining situation look like? Mm -hmm. And w what does the world accept, right? Mm -hmm. Like, I'm not gonna try to influence it one yeah. way or the other. I'm, yeah. I'm agnostic, I don't care. I just want what's best for the network. Yeah. And people have been voting with their capital that BTC is, is the real the Bitcoin. One. That's so. what has the network effects. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense to me. Yeah. I mean, these, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll say we'll we'll dive yeah. deeper on this in another episode, but uh, on to the next question. So, Nikki, we've got a couple personal finance questions. Uh, Blue Agave asks, how do pensions work? I have a 401k and a pension, but I don't plan to retire from this organization. Well, if you're not going to retire from the organization, odds are you're probably not going to get the pension. But my suggestion with pensions is to contact the company, the administrator, find out what the vesting schedule is because every vesting schedule is different. Some corporations want you there for, 
years to even give you a dime of the pension. Some of them will let you vest, you know, grade it over time. Mm -hmm. um, so like if you retire at 20 years versus, or 10 years versus 20 years, you'll get like half or something? Yeah, so like you need to be there for at least, you know, five years to get 60% of the pension or okay. I don't know the numbers off the top of my head, but um, you can, gr you can, it can grade vest, meaning you'll get 20% vest, you'll be 40% vested, 60% vested over time. Yeah. Um, or some of them are like a cliff vest where you need to be there for X amount of years to get a hundred percent of the pension. So it's so all or nothing. It, it, it can vary. So gotcha. you have to find out. And the other thing about pensions to find out is find out how they calculate the benefit. The retirement benefit are the, is it calculated off of a percentage of your salary is it uh calculated off of meaning like do they do they uh add in like how many years you've been at the company um there's different ways to calculate the actual benefit gotcha. so that's another thing to find out so is that a weird conversation to have then like if if she goes to her employer and is like you know, I'm probably not going to be here for the whole, no, the you know. the employer's probably like, sweet. Yeah. They don't have to pay for it. Okay. So maybe going to like an HR person and being like, hey, I, I'm not making any decisions today, but I just want to know what yeah, this vesting schedule looks like. And not a weird question at all. Okay. In fact, the, the employer, you know, is taking all the risk and they are essentially having to dish out the cash. So um, if they lose someone that money that they, if they weren't 100% vested, that money goes back into their pile and they can, you know, allocate it elsewhere. So yeah. I feel like I would just play dumb. I would, I would go <laughs> to the HR and be like, hey, I'm curious how the pension stuff works. Can you send me the documents? Yeah. But the documents is the key part, right? Because that's where all the details will be. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. My, my husband or so-and-so is asking and I, mm -hmm. I don't know. So yeah, just pass it over. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that way you don't have to be like, I'm quitting. <laughs> <laughs> I plan to quit. Yeah, I so, plan to leave. <laughs> so here's my notice. I'm going to get my full pension, right? <laughs> <laughs> We've got another question from uh, Jenna, Jenna, Jenna Travels. Uh, do you have suggestions for where to open a Roth IRA? So I, and I am not paid by Fidelity at all, but I really like their platform. I think mm -hmm. it's super user-friendly. Um, and Charles Schwab, is another one. I mean, really any major broker broker is going to offer a mm -hmm. Roth IRA, but yeah, I would say Fidelity Schwab. Okay. So they can just go directly. Two main and ones. They can go directly. It's like opening a bank account. Super easy. They walk you through it online and you can just transfer money in from your bank account. Awesome. Easy enough. Well, I guess we can go ahead and wrap it up there. And, um, Guys, thank you for watching. Um, just a couple of things. We do have the We Talk Money uh, website up, so you can go submit a question at our homepage there. Don't forget to subscribe to the audio podcast on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Um, I'll also link up Nikki and Travis's YouTube channels. They are uh, really just getting started and launching content around their specific expertise Expertises, expert, <laughs> expertise. <laughs> <laughs> so Nikki, you're going to be focusing on what? Personal finance. Personal finance. Yeah. All across the board, all things, financial planning. Awesome. So. And then Trav, you're diving into. I'm the stock geek. The you're stock the stock geek. geek all stocks all the time. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> I'll touch on other stuff too. I like, kind of like that tagline. Yeah. <laughs> stock geek, all stocks all the time. <laughs> Love it. Well, thanks for joining me guys. And we will see you in the next episode next week. Ciao. Have a good one.